Can a database effectively process 10,000 documents per second while simultaneously holding 1.3 billion documents? Rakuten Kobo needed an answer. An ebook retailer that holds an ever expanding library of digital assets and users, their incumbent systems could no longer handle their continuously expanding load. Couchbase and RavenDB became leading contenders to replace Rakuten's obsolete database. Using public documents, a data set was replicated, replete with the 1.3 billion documents necessary to demonstrate each database's ability to handle Rakuten's load. Both RavenDB and Couchbase were measured on load and performance, which database could do more in less time. By recreating the Rakuten system, RavenDB was able to show its prowess against one of the best databases in the industry and clearly show what it can do by handling 15,000 requests per second while Couchbase stalled at just 250. Today, RavenDB CEO Oren Amy presents this scenario doing live benchmarking. He will discuss problems that can occur that you might not see at first glance. He will pull the shades up on each database so you can see where the bumps are and how to avoid them. Feel free to ask questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and Oren will be happy to answer them throughout the session. Enjoy your presentation and here's Oren. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. And this webinar is really interesting. I hope it's going to be fun. It's the culmination of several months of work of both us and some of the people at Kobo Rakuten. Uh, and basically we've taken a scenario, a real production scenario that we were presented with from a customer and we turn that into a public benchmark. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to present our finding, discuss some of them in detail. I would absolutely love it if you have any questions whatsoever, raise them as they come. I would uh, be very happy to take them. Uh, so I don't know if you're aware of that, Kobo Rakuten is a pretty big company. She, they are dealing with uh, uh, selling digital books, a whole bunch of other stuff like that. And uh, you can read the blurb later. The interesting thing from our perspective is that they have these kind of devices and they sold a lot of those. And what we're talking about here is the backend for that, being able to manage and uh, operate all of the uh, server side for tens of millions of devices. Now, the interesting from our perspective is that, well, to start with, this is typically connected to Wi-Fi or a, a cellular connections. Uh, so you can assume that the network itself is flaky. It is often used in harsh environments, has to be operating under oh, I just want to go and buy something or sell something, something like, something like that. As you can imagine, the uh, speed and performance is crucial. I will remind you, Amazon had a study on latency impact on the bottom line, and every 100 millisecond was 1% less in the shopping cart. So when... Kobo Akuten came to us and told us, okay, we have this scenario. The things that, the two things that they most cared about was what is the response time? And by the response, I'm talking about how many of the requests will complete by X amount of time? And what is the variability of that? Can we be certain that we'd always hit that limit? And the other thing is about operational concerns. How can I run this system in production? How can I make sure that I don't have to worry about this? Their existing system used to be on Couchbase and pretty much all I can tell you about. And that sucks because uh, this is a really interesting scenario and uh, they're doing some really cool stuff. However, and the reason that we have done this, we have taken publicly available data and recreated their scenario. More or less. So uh, we took a whole bunch of a, a data sets from the internet. There is a data set of 39 million users, of Reddit users. There is the product Gutenberg. There is some data that we generated and we generated 
billion records. You can see the uh, data, uh, um, the division of data across the different collections that we have here. Users is the number of users, books is books, obviously. Users books is the association between the users who purchased the book. Highlights is when you go and mark a, a certain portion in the data. Additional books and authors are not really that relevant. Notice that you can go and click on this link and download the full data set. A word of warning, that's about 108 gigabyte. And this is the compressed version. If you import that into RavenDB, well, let me show you. This is, uh, sorry, this is the RavenDB instance. And unfortunately, this is actually running on a Raspberry Pi. So we're going to have to wait a bit for it to work. At least that's what I hope it would do. Oh, it's just an issue with the studio. Okay, so now I can see this is about one terabyte of data, of which 1.357 billion documents. Now, some of the documents are relatively simple. Some of them are a lot more interesting. This is annotation or highlights. And you can see someone marked this apparent uh, uh, section. And the whole idea is that we have a sufficiently big data set to start working on that. So let's think about what we want to do with something like that. So we threw a lot of data into the system. And then we are going to do a few things. First of all, we are going to try to run some queries to see how the system is going. Second, the uh, uh, second, we're going to try to mess things up. We're going to break the system intentionally and see how, how this is going. And finally, we're going to see some benchmarks. We have a question from Matthias Talkovsky, I assume. And is it a physical pie or a virtual pie? Well, it's this pie. I don't know if you can see, but the white keyboard there, this is actually a Raspberry Pi. And this is a physical one. I was actually not aware that we can have a virtual pies. And uh, for your information, if you really care, this is a Raspberry Pi 400, four cores, uh, Cortex A75, I think, 1.8 gigahertz with about five gigabyte of RAM. In other words, this is a pretty weak machine. To be, to be fair, it costs about $50. Not really that, uh, not really that impressive when you think about it. Uh, and we're still going to process terabyte a, a databases on that. Now, here is something interesting. The thing that we mostly care about is the 99.9% .9 What does this mean? It means that I'm trying to figure out how many of my requests are above a certain threshold. If 99.9 .9 of my requests are below, let's say 200 milliseconds, that can be my SLA. If one request in a thousand is below 200 milliseconds, I don't care that much. It's one off, uh, there might be any number of things that can happen. But the killer for me is that for the 99.9 percentile, .9%, all of them are less than that. So 200 milliseconds at the 99 percentile, 99.9 percentile means that only one in a thousand requests would be slower than this. And the actual number that we are eminent for most things is 99.99, which means that we want one in a 10,000 requests to exceed our defined SLA. Now, here, let me ask you a question. While I'm talking, please write either in the chat or in the QA, what you think is a reasonable SLA for running queries on the Pi. So let's say that I want to run, I don't know, 10 queries per second. 
what would be a reasonable SLA to expect that from the pipe? What would be if I do 100, 200, stuff like that? Remember, this is a terabyte level system, and we have four gigabytes of hub to play with. Now, the setup that we did went like this. We had a client, the benchmark client, this we're using work to. We had a dotted application, and we have the database itself. The database itself was running on three separate servers. And they were running as a cluster, and we tested both RavenDB and Couchbase on the same hardware. And this is where we got into some really, really interesting numbers. Now, the reason that I tested in this configuration, this is a real configuration. Almost real. Right? We talk about why it's uh, skewed against RevenB in a bit. This is how you would typically run. It's actually quite easy for us to define benchmark that goes directly to RevenDB. But when we build this kind of system, this shows us a lot more a uh, real world scenario. We actually had to disable RevenDB features for this system. For example, RevenDB client side has automatic caching and RevenDB server side can integrate with that and give you and not issue a query, just tell you, hey, this query that you previously uh, run, it's the same thing, it didn't change, here's what you have in the cache. So we actually have to disable, disable a whole bunch of features like that in order to make this a fair comparison. So here we go. We tested that on a whole bunch of hardware configuration. This is, all of that was running in AWS, same region, and we have the full details there. But this is the web application. This is the load generating system. Notice that this has 32 calls and we were able to get it to, to the point where we were saturating this instance. So we actually left performance on the table because honestly, we got some ridiculous numbers and it didn't make sense to try uh, going into distributed load generation just to see how far we can take this. Now, this is the baseline configuration that we use for Couchbase. This is actually less than the minimum required, but this is the minimum that we could use in order to provide you with a, a, a viable configuration. Now, I actually need to explain something here because this matters quite a lot. It's easy to say, oh, let's find the best performance numbers. And if you give me a big enough machine, I can hit any performance target that you want. But what we care about is how can I hit my performance targets with the cheapest price? Because I want the most bang for the buck. Now, even if I compare something like this, you can see that the Couchbase edition is almost twice as expensive as the RevenDB one, even when using the same machine type. This is because Couchbase is horrendously, horrendously disk hungry. When we try to use anything less than six terabytes of storage for this system, it would just eat up everything and die. I will actually touch on that later on. That was insane. So with RevenDB, we tested that on 32 cores, 138 gigabyte. All of those systems were running three servers in a cluster. Then we reduced it by half, and then we reduced it by four times and ran that on an ARM instance. This is actually insanely cheap, if you think about that. Now, let's see how we can take it uh, even more, because we also did performance optimi performance benchmarks on a Raspberry Pi. Now, same availability zone, same network, the communication between, Reven between the application RevenDB was using a TLS, so secure certificate, absolute production scenario. 
the communication with Couchbase was in plain text because I tried to figure out how to deploy Couchbase securely and I think I had a, a, a blackout. So we skipped that. And let's see. First thing that we had to do was load the data in. That in RavenDB, we prepared the data, we basically did the bulk insert, and that took just under 24 hours. Average write of 20,000 writes per second. And that's it. Now, we didn't do any fancy stuff. You could do that. And if you do fancy stuff, you can get to 100 to 150,000 writes per second sustained across hours and days at a time. Now, uh, we run all of this on GP2 and GP3 instances inside of RevenDB. Uh, we, if you want more performance while you load data into RevenDB, you can use parallel uh, back inserts. You can make sure that all of your IDs are uh, uh, sorted in a, a incremental fashion, in a, a lexically sequential fashion. You can enable document compression. This is actually really interesting. Let me take you here and see something. You can see that this has about half the number of documents that we have in here, but it's only about a quarter of the size. In here, I'm actually storing the data in a compressed format. I actually run out of time. I will explain sh uh, uh, shortly exactly why when doing this, because it's run for two days. And uh, just to give you some idea about uh, the situation, that means that if we completely the, do this, we're probably going to be about 50% about this space saving. And remember just those numbers, this versus this is just because of the additional storage. So there is a lot of things that we could have done for RevenDB. We decided to try to make this as far as possible. With Couchbase, things did not work out that well. Now, I will start by saying in advance, I know RevenDB. I know how it works. I built most of that myself. I have been involved in every little decision. So I, I grok that. At the same time, I've been dealing with databases for the past 15 to 20 years and making Couchbase work was a pain. Every time we just blinked at that, it broke in all sorts of really, really crazy stuff. Just to give you some, some examples, I'm running this sort of system on a Pi. This is, a, this is the nearest thing you can get to the disposable computer. With Couchbase, I had to go with sharding from day one. We, I started doing the import on a machine that had eight cores and 32 gigabytes on RevenDB. On Couchbase, it died. I had to keep upping the system limits, keep getting better and better hardware to, just to get it to work. And even so, it took a lot of time. Now, let, now it's easy for me to just say, hey, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Let me talk about concrete details. So the first problem, by default, it stored every, all of the metadata, at least, in memory. Now, if you have a small amount of data, that's perfect. You want to get that high performance except that the overhead that it has per document is absolutely insane. And if you have to keep all of the metadata in memory, then this is what you have to keep, 132 gigabyte just for the metadata. And if you don't do that, then you start getting these sort of errors. This is about midway through the process. And this kind of sucks. And now you're going to hit higher level and then the system is basically going to die. So there is something called full ejection, which it doesn't store all of the keys and the, uh, uh, and the metadata in memory. But even with full ejection, 
we had to do two really crazy things. We have to go to 128 gigabyte per machine. Remember, we have three machines here. And we have to set the maximum threshold at 80%, not 90%. If we were setting it at 80%, that would, that would give us, uh, uh, that would basically kill the system because it would utilize too, memory, too much memory, go to swap and effectively die. So that was one issue. The other problem was that it was still not enough. At some point I decided, okay, I loaded the data, it's okay. Let's reduce the size of the machine and start it up again. And something really, really interesting happened. The number of documents that I have on the system went down. Just went poof. I did not understand that, but apparently it ran out of memory to allocate to them and it just stopped. And if you went into the system, at some place you could might, might have seen that this is an issue. But everything else appeared to be fine, except that a third of the data wasn't there. Again, I cannot tell you how, how much this bugs me as a database guy, because if a third of my data is down, I absolutely want to be no about that. I want the system to break in an extremely visible manner. Now, let's talk about the disk and how it works. Couchbase uses an append-only model. The whole idea is that you have a file and you keep writing to the end of the file. This is an extremely elegant system. This is elegant because it means that you have the ability to uh, effectively you're crash safe. Worst case scenario, you crash, some of the data isn't there, just scan from the end of the file backward until you find the last valid operation. Perfect, makes sense. Except that what happened when you modify things? You don't delete the data. So you have to do a compaction. Now, our scenario was insert only, but the way that Couchbase spoke, every update have, every time that you update a record, you have to update all of the internal indexes and trees, and those get added to the end. So you have effectively a copy on write tree that uh, every time that you append to it, you have to copy the whole, uh, uh, the whole chain of modified a, a nodes up. And at some point you're going to require compaction. And here is what happens. This takes hours. And when it takes hours, a couple of really interesting happen. First, you have to allocate a lot more disk space. And at the same time, you have a lot of reads and writes operations that burn through your IO like crazy. So you have to get really high-end disks. What happens if you don't have enough disk space? Do you know what happens? The system dies. Couchbase would basically just kill itself. A full disk, is just about the most expected error you can run into. Just to give you some example, when RevenDB hits a full disk error, it's going to abort all additional writes and it's going to keep, allow you to keep on doing read operations. The moment that you give me more disk space, you free some things, there is also some background processes that try to uh, free memory it will keep on working. The server doesn't die. That's just insane to me. We also have this notion of indexes. Indexes are very important for a database, except that the sizes of indexes in Couchbase was just absolutely insane. And again, indexes also suffer from two additional problems. 
One, they are also turned on right, which means that you have to do compaction on them. But in order to maintain consistency for the indexes, Couchbase is using snapshot, which means that you have at any point in time up to five by default snapshots of the same index. If you have a large index in the hundreds of gigabyte, you're wasting half a terabyte of this space. And the other index was, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to talk about it. That's just absolutely insane. Especially when you consider what is the impact of that in a real world performance. Okay, so let's talk about IOP. IOPS is one of the things that you tend to pay a lot for in the cloud, any general. When the model that Couchbase uses causes write amplification, you write to the data file, and at some point you have to read the entire data file and write it again, and then do it again, and again. You have the data file, you have index file, you have snapshots. All of them are working together to effectively take your disk and go like this, and just kids it. We had to up the minimum acceptable disk for Couchbase multiple times. We ended with, a, a, I don't remember the a IO1 or IO2 disk on AWS with thousands of a, a reserve IOPS. And we still saw Couchbase saturated the disk. Just to give you some idea, I'm going to do a benchmark in a bit where I'm running RevenDB on top of an HDD. That's one of those things that's spinning us that you should absolutely never use. This is also a, a disk that, I, that we had uh, for about a decade or so. So, uh, well, no, not a decade, five years or so. The decade one is reserved for other abuses. Uh, and you're expected to, at least for reasonable amount of loads, to just handle that. Couchbase just run through all of the capacity that we could give it, and it was not performing properly for that. Now, let's talk about startup time. That's fine. On startup, regardless or if you have full ejection or not, Couchbase needs to read all of the keys. Here is a cluster. They're calling it a warm -up process. And you can see that Couchbase, we started this from a cold boot and it's reading. This can take hours. And again, very high IOP usage. Now, during the time frame, that node is dead. Really dead. It can't uh, accept any writes, it can't accept any reads. It's sort of right because you can see it and ping it, but it's not doing much. Also note that in terms of the utilization that we have here, full memory utilization, but almost no CPU. This is because you're stuck doing out of IO. That sucks. That sucks a lot because it brings up another major issue that you have to deal with. Any hiccup is an outage. And that turns out to have some interesting implications. Couchbase will rebalance not if there is a failure. This is perfectly reasonable thing to do. In fact, RevenDB has a similar feature. However, the default trigger for Couchbase is two minute trigger. If you have a greater than 30 minutes startup time for a node, what do you think is going to happen? Well, a hiccup is going to trigger rebalance. And we clocked some rebalance operation at over 40 hours. Now, let me give you some idea about what it means. You have a Couchbase cluster 
And for whatever reason, one of the nodes, I don't know, had a disk full. Couchbase dies. The rest of the nodes in the cluster start rebalancing the system. They, that means that you obviously have more data into the, you push more data into those nodes. Oh wait, we're close to full disk anyway. And now you have a cascade failure and your entire system fails. We have tested that, it happens. That's crazy. Now, even without catastrophic failures, it's sufficient that a single node for whatever reason decides to uh, uh, reboot. A server head to restart, whatever. Here's what's going to happen. You're running, everything is, uh, is happy, and then you have a compaction or a rebalance. And this is what's going to happen to your system. And that creates an environment in which you're very afraid of your database because any hiccup has dramatic consequences. But okay, you know what? Leaving that aside, how about queries? Couchbase is supposed to be a mostly memory or main memory database, so it's supposed to be fast. So we tested that with queries and we, uh, in Couchbase you have to define, if you want to do queries by primary key, you have to define the index for them. Okay. So we went ahead and defined that and it took four days, 14 hours and change. That's just ridiculous. You can see this, this was the rate in which it went, like pretty much nothing. I'm actually going to show you later how the Raspberry Pi is doing indexing. So you can compare. It's insane. If you have secondary indexes, then the, the situation is worse. And again, I'm comparing my own knowledge of RevenDB to what I know of Couchbase and the capabilities that you have in your indexes are drastically different. Now, something that is actively painful from my perspective is that the Couchbase documentation tells you that you should create the same exact index multiple times. Think about it. You have, let's say that you want to index by name. So you have docs by name one, docs by name two, docs by name three. Why on earth would you want to do that? Well, because then Couchbase can, can do load balance. And that's just like, Seriously? Just for information, if you create an index in RevenDB, it's created on all of the nodes in the cluster and load balancing is just a built-in feature. You don't really need to think about it. And in many cases, you see a lot of micromanagement and babysitting of the cluster. Okay, uh, this is just a, a caveat. Uh, Couchbase came from, uh, from CouchDB. One of the nicest things about CouchDB was the notion of design documents, that you can define some sort of a set of JavaScript functions that could operate over your, uh, over your data and transform that and operate on that. And that was actually the inspiration for what became the RevenDB indexes. We initially tried to use them. They make indexes fast, look fast. They are horrible performance for indexing and for queries. We reach out to uh, some part of ours who are familiar with working on Couchbase and don't use that. That's just legacy crap that no one wants to deal with. And what is probably the worst possible thing from my perspective, everything else I could, uh, well, Oh well, oh well. Someone decided that errors are not for mere mortals. Do you see this? It took me a while to figure out what's going on. There are lines like that in the uh, uh, Couchbase log files. And you look at it to say, what's going on? Why do you have that? 
And then you realize that this is actually ASCII code. And you can decode that into an actual error message. But all of them are just, you know, ASCII numbers. So if, you can't just open that and read them. A lot of the, uh, so it looks like they dumped a lot of raw airline structures directly into the log and call it a day. From my perspective, a log is part of the interface to the system. It has to be grappable, it has to be human readable, you have to understand that. And in many cases, it feels that Couchbase is actively hiding errors. For example, let's take a look at this. I'm running this particular system and I messed up the file configuration. So I'm going to get this error. And this is a surprise to me because I created that. I can see that, but I could not connect to that. But it wouldn't tell me cannot connect to port X. It would tell me, oh, this database does not exist. It's your problem, you figure it out. At some point I felt like he, uh, this is laughing at me. Now, uh, now that I have this off my chest, uh, and trust me, I have had spent many, many hours ranting about those things. Uh, I know RevenDB. I have done the research on Couchbase, but I'm by no means an expert. I have consulted with an expert or some export, not exports, and a, a boat in the how Cobra can run this in production and how, what is the recommended uh, approach to do that. And what we observed much the expected behavior. Couchbase is a memory force database. So if the data is bigger than memory, that is a huge problem. And the common solution for that is to add more nodes, give more capacity to the system. The problem is that then the cost benefit ratio goes away because you want to get acceptable performance at the minimum price, not let's up the price more and more and more until we get to acceptable performance. Another caveat is that we had to test the community edition or the enterprise edition because of licensing restrictions. Uh, it's possible that they are different in this regard. Now, here are two details that uh, we got. We have, we are never touching Couchbase because a node might go down. And we had to, even if we have to increase capacity on the system, that's actually going to generate a, an outage. That's from a Trevor, who is, he, who is the CEO of uh, Koborakuten. And, we, and there is uh, Don Greenzeig, who talks about moving away from Couchbase. I believe that they went into DynamoDB in this case. He's from SimmerWeb. I believe even bigger data set than what uh, Rakuten has, but uh, you can see multiple outages and significant overhead and a lot of operation times. Now, now that we have everything, let's talk about actual numbers. And let me just check the chat. What did you guess? we are going to see here. Okay, no guesses, that said. So uh, we have someone who is uh, raising their hands. Yes, uh, you can talk. Sorry, I clicked by mistake. Okay. So anyone here wants to comment, want to make a guess about what numbers we're going to look at? Let's look at that. So this is the first thing. The idea here is that this is the RQL query. This is the query using the um, 
the Couchbase uh, syntax. So for this collection, use the limit, use the equal this, and the same thing in here. And this is basically give me the recent highlights per user. This is an operation that required that we'll use an index. Now, here are the numbers. Couchbase at 250 requests per second basically exceeded the maximum allow size, maximum allow latency. At this point, more than only 20% of the requests hit the required size. For EvenDB, we can see we're not doing so good, except that here we are at the 93 percentile at 15,000 requests per second. And 5,098, 1,099.9, and etc. What's interesting that in all cases, if we set the maximum limit, at 800 milliseconds, RevenB is able to process that even under 15,000 requests per second. Again, our goal is 99.99 percentile and 200 milliseconds. What we're interested in is what is the load that we need in order to hit that number. And that's really interesting. Remember, the couch base example is sharded. The Reven, in the RevenB case, we have split the load across all of the nodes. Now, this is an interesting case because we have to use an index. But we don't have to. Let's look at this. This is the structure of the ID. So if I want to say, give me all of the highlights by user, I can say, hey, just do it like this. And by user and ebook, just do it like this. So that looks like it's an interesting idea. In fact, this is actually called explicitly in the Couchbase documentation, is something that you want to use a primary index for. So let's try that. And now we're seeing something really interesting. Couchbase, if you use perfect queries, even with the primary index, even with everything, the system dies. We couldn't hit 50, 100 requests per second. 100% CPU, I have no idea what it's doing there. So this still keeps slightly higher in this benchmark. 30 percentile at 250, uh, we already uh, over, uh, so 70 percent of the requests are over 12 milliseconds at 250 requests per second. For even DB, we're now at 99.98 for 15,000 requests per second. You can see here, this is for uh, this is for 5,000 and for uh, 10,000 or uh, 4,500. That's amazing. That's exactly what we want to do. Now, the reason this matters is that this sort of query in RevenDB can operate on the internal uh, uh, data structure that we use. So we don't even have to share to an index. This is interesting when we are using an index because that gives us, okay, what happens if I have complex queries and a, uh, as well as high load? Okay. Now, we also tested what's going on when we query by ID. So if we know what the ID here, what do we see? And this is where Couchbase actually shines. It was able to process everything really, really quickly, 100% in 73 milliseconds. And this is under 30,000 requests per second. RevenDB is only at 99.97, and again, 30,000 uh, requests per second. The reason for this, by the way, is that uh, at this load and this speed, 
it's sufficient to have even one or two page faults to impact your system. Those are benchmarks that we typically run for multiple minutes. So a lot of the variance is gone, but still at 30,000 requests per second, even the most minimum of things can have an impact on your system. Now, we went and looked at the actual sizing that we have for this thing. And based on the RevenDB documentation, five machine, at least 198 gigabyte per machine in order to handle this. Now, for RevenDB, we kept pushing things down. Because again, those are it's great the Couchbase can handle by key at 30,000K per second. And Raven here can push 15,000 requests per second for prefix queries. And it's, let's say, 5,000 uh, queries per second. We're able to get some really nice numbers. But the interesting from our perspective is, okay, what happens if I don't need 5,000 queries per second? Let's say I want a thousand. What is the, uh, uh, what hardware can I get in order to actually get the required level of performance? So this is testing RevenDB with 10,000 queries per second. This is get by key. Notice that this guy, this is an ARM core, uh, ARM system. This is a Graviton M6 G18. Just two cores and eight gigabyte. We're able to process almost 97% of the request under 200 milliseconds. And basically everything else that we tested, including these four cores and 16 gigabyte, you meet the required at 100%. Those are drastically, drastically cheaper. This is for queries. Remember that in this case, Couchbase couldn't handle that at 250 requests per second. So on the R machine, this is with 1,000 queries per second, not viable. But look at this, 1,000 queries per second, both of these would be viable. And if we had 500 queries per second, this might be as well. In fact, we tested that. 500 requests per second, that looks good to me. And then we actually tested that on the Raspberry Pi. And again, this is a single Raspberry Pi. This is actually a cluster of three nodes. And this is a couch-based server where each of the node has 32 cores and 128 gigabyte compared to this. And with perfect queries, which are, again, insanely fast. Okay. Now, this is the end result. This is where uh, uh, we actually made all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the number work. So if you have 30,000 requests per second, this is couch base, cost of that is $140,000. RevenDB, we offer three different configurations and you can see the numbers. The, the cost savings here are insane. But those are just the cost savings when we are talking about the, uh, uh, the hardware or the servers that we rent. It's a lot more interesting when you think that RevenDB is basically offering you a homogeneous environment. All of the systems are running the same thing. At the same time, Couchbase has seven different services that you deploy and manage. Each one of them has its own independent and correlated configurations. And we saw that in the field, people run into problems. That was a huge problem in production for similar web, for a, a Rakuten, for other users. That's really hard to operate. And now we're going to take this. And again, this is a Raspberry Pi inside the keyboard. I love the idea, by the way. And we're going to try to look at some numbers. So let me check something. So now you can see that we have 
the Raspi Pyranin. It's mostly not doing much, and now I'm going to start generating some load. I want you to pay attention to two things. First of all, you can see that we are nearing 200 queries per second. And look at the CPU utilization. Look at the memory utilization. They're effectively flat. We don't really need to think about them. Just to give you some idea, and just so you know, all of the information that we have is publicly uh, available. This is what I'm doing. I'm running this command. And basically saying use work, 16 connection on four threads on my part, run it for 30 seconds, execute this script, which we'll look in a second, and use 150 requests per second. And basically I'm saying, okay, read it and start pushing a, a request to the server. Notice that we're using streams to, to disable, uh, we're hitting the server here directly. Uh, we are uh, uh, using stream to disable any sort of caching. And those are the sort of queries that we generate. So all of them are prefix queries or annotations. And we have different IDs here, and we have a total of, I think, 100,000 different, uh, 100, different queries that we generate. And we basically do round robin among them or something like that. Now, the reason I'm using that with threading is that we would have an unpredictable, or mostly unpredictable output to the system. Now, what I want you to pay attention, look at this. This is the uh, average numbers. We're starting to put some load on the system. And we can see that everything works. We actually have spare capacity as far as computer memory are concerned. And we are pushing quite a lot of data through the system. And 100% of the query ended in 66 milliseconds. Now, let it sink in for, uh, for a minute. What we have here? We have a situation where this is the system. We have an 8 terabyte disk. This is a hard disk. And you can see those are the numbers that we have. We have 42 IOPS for writes and 126 IOPS for read. That's basically nothing. But Revenue was able to make sure that you have everything in memory and operation. For a, 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 the type of load that is quite interesting. So right now, as I said, run it for 30 minutes. We're not going to wait here for 30 minutes, obviously. I just want you to be able to see what the system is doing. Because what's happening right now is that we have just enough capacity in the system for everybody to manage what's going on. When you can actually pick on behind the scenes, and this is running Nmon, to check what's going on in the disk. And you can see that at 200 requests per second with one millisecond response time on average, everything is being served from memory. The reason that I emphasize this is that Couchbase is meant to be a memory force database. RevB is not. But Couchbase is actually, okay, now we are starting to see that we are uh, going beyond the memory limit that uh, the system has, and now we are starting to see the load. And you can see that this, the speed of the request and the number of them drop significantly because now we have to go to the to the disk a lot. And remember, this is a really really bad disk. And now I can see, and you can see that some of the requests are going to be much much longer. I think that in the almost 40 seconds to hit that because of IO issues. I can actually reproduce this more easily if I'm going to set the load at 250, uh, uh, 250 uh, requests per second. 
and we start and we operate quite nicely. We actually are able to process things very well. And at some point we start hitting stuff that isn't in the disk, because again, remember that what we're doing is actually quite big in terms of the number of queries and the workloads that we have. And now we start hitting the actual physical hardware limits. You can see it here. If I would plug in a better disk, I would have a much better rate. And this is effectively how it should be. I can also get a Raspberry Pi with eight gigabytes, and then it would be able to handle that a lot more easily. And if I had a cluster, a tree, a cluster of three of them, that would be actually be able to handle up to about 1200, 1300 requests per second under load. Now, this is interesting because if you think about what is the typical number of requests that you have to deal with, let's take something. Uh, so, this is obviously, this is Hacker News. This is obviously a very well-known website. And somewhere around here, I believe that we have the number of, okay. Uh, let's see if I have the, I remember seeing that, okay. So, to, so this is the total number of visits in the past, it took like six months. So 10.18 times million uh, divided by 730 hours per month, divided by 360, uh, 3,600 seconds per hour. Extremely unscientific and probably wrong, but you can see that the numbers that we're talking about here is absolutely insane. And I remember that we had the number, the uh, number here somewhere of the total uh, per time, but I can't see it now. So look at this at a different uh, level. But I noticed that we're still operating quite nicely the system is slow. This is not ideal. The user will certainly feel the difference between one millisecond, two milliseconds to 200 milliseconds for response time. But the system keep operating. In fact, I'm going to go and do something quite nasty. I'm going to add even more load to the system. And you can see how we adjust. This is going to be slow. Okay. Look at the system, we are still operating. Basically what's happening right now is that we are struggling to hit the disk all the time. Therefore we have low latency a higher latency of requests. But the system operates. We don't have to worry about that. RMB is going to do the maximum possible to ensure that you're able to run with no issues. This is uh, uh, what I had to say. Oh, let me, before that, I promise that I would go ahead and create an index on this system. So form, let's say users, your name. Now, in this case, what I have, I have a system that is composed of a 39, uh, uh, no, sorry, not 39, uh, 69. Audrey. 
Why? Oh yeah, sorry. HTTPS, I need HTTP. Okay, so no, this is what we want. Let's give it a second. Apparently it does not want. Oh, I am stupid. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was introducing this thing and it killed my system. So I removed that. And then I disabled indexing. I forgot about that. The risk of trying to make sure that the demo is nice. Okay. Let's get this as well. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So now we go here. Hopefully now. Why are you indexing disabled? Oh, hey, come on. Sorry. Disable this. So what happened is that uh, I think that uh, if I enable it, it needs to do that. Yes, that's what we expect to do. So we are, what's happening right now is that we are generating a lot of uh, IO on the system and apparently it's kidding us. Okay. Now, okay, this is by the way, an interesting scenario. We have a one terabyte system and I'm going to enable this. Let's see what's going on. We're writing and very quickly, we're expected to see something here. Let's see, force it to refresh and we're still unloading. Yeah. Okay. You're unloading and then it would be loaded at some point. Oh well, you know what we do? We do so we do things different. We let it finish doing its thing because it's starved on IO. Okay. And now, now it's up, running. And let's see what it is actually doing. Okay. This is what I basically wanted you to see. We're now indexing on the Raspberry Pi at a rate that is about three times faster than what we saw on the Raspberry Pi, on the Couchbase system. And I'm going to let it run while we're talking, and then we're going to see what this can do, what this can do for us. We have some of the questions that uh, I was asked in advance. I'm going to answer them. This is your time to ask any questions that you have. As I mentioned, I would love to have them. So Michael Gustafsson is asking, how do I get the performance described? And we have this, what I just described here, and all of these details are also available in this white paper. I'm going to throw that on the chat so everyone has the link. And this is all the details, how to reproduce everything that you need to do. So how do you reproduce something like that? Well, a lot of that depend on what is your SLA and what metrics you're trying to achieve. We achieve this by specifying a cluster with three node of the desired size. When we did that, we went here and said that we want to have read load balancer with round robin. And hit save here and automatically in about two seconds, all of your clients are going to start a round robin all of your uh, queries across all of the nodes in the cluster. You can also do use this, which allows you to use load balancing for reads and writes, but that's a separate uh, issue altogether. Uh, no, it's not done, it's waiting for IO. By the way, here is an interesting thing that you can do. You can go here 
and actually look into exactly what's going on. You can see here that what we're doing here, we are committing to Lucene, and now we are writing to the disk. And that much what we are seeing actually here, that we are being stalled by the disk. And again, it's very, very easy to get really good performance when you're running on fast systems. Our challenge is how do we do that when we're running on low end hardware? Okay, so all of this was right into disk, and now we are back at indexing stage. And now we can actually go here and start looking. Here, all of the interesting numbers, how many uh, input, output, what exactly am I doing? Where is this time spent? Exactly. Uh, so load balancing is one factor. Other factor is policing your queries. The scenario that we have here is when we are looking at one query per request. In many cases, you have multiple queries like that. And which case you want to use lazy includes to reduce the number of round trips that you have. Uh, we have a bunch of users who are so, who seen performance in the single, single single digit milliseconds, even on high load, and you just yeah sure that's that's the way that it's supposed to be. If you're running on three point five still, you won't see that performance upgrade. A KG Vidovic or Davidovich uh, is not going to be good to replace SQL database in engineering design project. If you're asking me, probably. Uh, what is in the engineering design? Is it, are you talking about relatively complex systems that uh, uh, models? Uh, Workflow stuff like that, yeah, absolutely. Revenue B would be excellent for something like that. Uh, but if you want to know more, we have the live demo. You can register for that. And one of the things that we do there is discuss such scenarios and how you can best use Revenue B for those situations. Uh, we have Hai Huang, which I hope I'm not butchering too badly. Uh, is Revit be suitable for real-time data processing and whole historical data? Yes, it does. Revit B is really good at that story. We actually have that as a built-in feature. And this is the time series uh, data that we have. Let me show you. You can have historical data metrics, in this case, let's go to employees. An employee have, or employee supposed to have a heart rate. No, let's look at companies then. What version am I running that I'm not seeing that? Oh, we are not done yet. Aren't we? Yes wasn't done yet. Okay. So by the way, notice that Revenue B is nice enough to say, hey, I have a problem. You don't have to search for that. You don't have to, it will tell you. There's no ASCII numbers in some log files that you never heard of in your face. So you can see here, here the all sorts of numbers about uh, a, a, a real-time data uh, stock processing for stocks. And you can see that RevenB allows you to display the change over times and all sorts of other stuff like that. Uh, we have a question from Avi Farah about, if I have compare change, can I replicate it across cluster? And the answer is no, and you don't want to do that. And that actually requires some explanation about what compare change is. RevenB is a document database. In addition to that, RevenDB also has key value stored directly in it. Now, this is, a, here is a key, here is a value. The value can be any JSON token. So this is valid or an array or whatever you want. But this does not get replicated across the cluster. 
And the question here is why? Why don't we do that? I mean, it would make sense to, to do that, no? A compare exchange is a value that allows you to do consistent operation across the cluster. It can use for lock-in, for a, a, it's one of the ways that we maintain a cluster-wide transaction, a whole bunch of other stuff like that. The killer from our perspective is that if you replicate that between clusters, the cluster is the unit of consistency for a compare exchange. Replicate that between cluster means that you no longer have this unit of consistency. If you want to do, use that, just use a standard collection. It's much better for this. And with that, do you have any more questions? I'll be speaking for uh, almost 70 minutes. It is absolutely possible that uh, uh, that have stunned you. So while we're waiting for more questions, if you have, remember later on, stuff like that, hit this link, you can do that. You can also just hit the contact, send us an email. Uh, we'll be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, this is the uh, this is the paper. Uh, you can go and look into that and see all of the details, number breakdown, how to reproduce, etc. And with that, I really hope that it will it was a, I really hope it was an interesting webinar for you. It was certainly interesting for me. And thank you and have a great week.